Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. Paul doing a fantastic job of, uh, of saying why uh, he's where he is, what he's doing, why they arrested him. And because he was saying th there was a resurrection, Jesus Christ resurrected. And when we believe on repentance on him, we have eternal life. And this is the message he's giving. Now, don't forget, we have, we have um, uh, King Agrippa, and um, we have old Porky here, okay? Now, Porky has absolutely no knowledge whatsoever of Christianity, of the way. But King Agrippa does. And King Agrippa is listening here to Paul's story, and... Uh, Paul knows that King Agrippa knows the message pretty well. So Paul is playing uh, um, both ends against the middle, as some would say, and coming out a winner. Why? Because God's with him. Christ has already informed him and on, um, that he's going to Rome. So he doesn't too much have to worry about going back to Jerusalem and being murdered there because um, he has already declared, I, I plead to Caesar. And that means he's going. Okay, so we pick it up then with chapter 26, verse 19, after Paul has just uh, reiterated, if you would, what happened to him on the road to Damascus that time, how that the Lord spoke to him. And we pick it up in verse 19 when he continues after giving that report. And the word reads in 26, 19, with that word of wisdom from our Father, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. I wasn't. I kept my word. I did it as the Father instructed me. Turning people, as verse 18 says, from darkness to light, from turning them from Satan to God and bringing them, uh, teaching them forgiveness of sins and their inheritance uh, among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That is to say the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That was his message, verse 20. But showed first unto them of Damascus. I preached first in Damascus after the conversion and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea. And then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. In other words, I taught Jesus Christ uh, to not only in Jerusalem, not only in Damascus, but also... I, I taught the Gentiles. That was the message, that was the credentials God placed upon him way back in chapter 9, verse 15, okay? Verse 21. For these causes, the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. It was for, for this teaching. This is the real reason they want to kill me. Now, you got to remember, what was Paul doing in the temple? Paul was in the stages of purification with the vow of, concerning the vow of a Nazarite. He could not have been doing anything negative or against anyone through that time of purification. And he had other witnesses taking the purification at the same time that knew that. Verse 22. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continued unto this day, witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. In other words, I haven't taught anything but the word of God. Moses being the law and the prophets being prophecy concerning the, this time or any time. For God's word always changes. He said, I haven't brought any message other than that that is of God, for God, and by God. Now, this is why you want to, when you pick 
teachers, pick one that teaches God's Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. He shouldn't be teaching anything else. It isn't necessary to teach anything else because God's Word covers all subjects, all, all conditions, all happenings, because there's nothing new under the sun. And our Father could see way past what we can to advise us, counsel us, lead us, guide us into that path of righteousness that brings forth eternal life. And what he's saying here, you will never find anyone that will witness that I have said anything that isn't written. Verse 23, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Now, where in the world was that written that Christ would rise from the dead, that he would uh, die that death on the cross? Psalms 22, a thousand years before the fact. How many men could put together and control the moment, that is to say, political, religious, economical, and, uh, and even educational, if you would. God controlled all of them. Why? Explain. Well, I'll be happy to. In, in the 22nd Psalm, which I stated a thousand years before the fact, he told, God told us exactly what the military of politics would be doing. They would be gambling for his clothing. Okay? And, and uh, what about the religious community? That they would be uh, swearing insults at the Messiah. Even the very words that came from the chief priest's mouth were written in that Psalms 22. So no man, no man, could arrange all that to happen a thousand years before the fact and have it come to pass exactly as it's written. Even down to his words, even the language in which he would speak. Right down to the very end and then the very end being it is finished or let it be known this is done, which is the Hebrew equivalent to the Greek it is finished. And he gave up the ghost to have that spirit return and be the very advocate and comforter of all that would walk in that way on repentance and on the remission of sins paid for by his blood, then there it was written a thousand years before the fact. Man could not do that. That would be an impossibility. This should, this by teaching Moses and the prophets, and David was a prophet, the Psalms are prophecy, then we know truth in advance. And it strengthens and takes any doubt away from a doubting Thomas that might even doubt the word of God. Because it's documented, line by line, precept by precept. So there we have it, teaching only God's word as it is written. Verse 24, and as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. In other words, what Festus is saying here, what you're saying is so far above my head, I have no idea what you're talking about. You're, you're so well educated and you're learning, it's made you mad. Now, a lot of people like Festus probably thought he was a religious fanatic. And this is why in protecting your credibility, you want to always make sure that God's word, which is not a religion, but a reality, makes common sense that protects your credibility as a bearer of truth in bringing forth the words of Moses and the words of the prophets. I could even add the words of the apostles. Verse 25. 
Paul answers, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. It's sincere, and I'm sincere about it. You will find nothing foreign or out of place about it. That's the exact actual events that happened on the road to Damascus, and my ministry henceforth. Verse 26. And Paul continues, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. In other words, I'm sure King Agrippa knows the truth. King Agrippa knows these things happen. It wasn't hidden away. It was obvious anyone could see it. And its history runs accurate. And King Agrippa was always interested in Christianity, studied a lot, asked a lot of questions. And Paul knew it. Always take advantage of a situation. And certainly Paul is here. He's using the king against Festus to a degree here. Verse 27, Paul continues. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets, Christian? I know that thou believest. Now he's kind of, he's being bold here. But at the same time, Paul knows that Agrippa does. Okay, 28. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And here Paul in his teaching and the fact that Agrippa knew the prophets, then almost persuaded. He said, you've just got me all but persuaded to be a Christian. Some of, some of the scholars translate this in a different way, but be that as it may, it uh, certainly, I, I think, will carry uh, the message there that you have people that their position and uh, the fact that he is King Agrippa, that it would, he would be giving up too much to the Roman government to be otherwise. So that kind of separates some people from teaching truth because they would have to give up retirements with certain associations and churches to teach the truth. Why? Because they would document and remove credentials and retirements. So you want to be quite careful when you begin to bring truth upon people of other persuasions knowing what it could cost them and with that understanding and protecting your credibility you can do a great deal more good in being cautious. That's to say gentle. That's the way you fish for men, is gentle. Until that hook is set, then set it. But until then, gentle, gentle persuasion. Almost persuaded, Paul. I'm almost persuaded, King Agrippa would say. And so it is. Verse 29, what, what's the answer? And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am except these bonds. In other words, he held out his hands, he was in chains. He said, I, I wish everybody was like I am except for these chains, that they would be captive in these chains. Now, uh, here you have to realize it's good. Paul's using every ounce He's innocent. He has no business even being in those chains. Okay. He's as innocent as can be. And here he flashes those chains right in the face of Festus and King Agrippa. And it, it has got to touch Agrippa to see him in those chains. Verse 30. And when he had thus spoken... The king rose up, and the governor, and Bernice, she was taking all this in, 
and they that sat with them. They rose up. They're going to get a little distance here. Verse 31. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. He's absolutely innocent. We have no business having chains on him. We have no grounds to even hold him. But you see, Paul had already played his trump card and it had God's approval because the Father through the Son had already told him, you are going to Rome. And therefore, uh, when, when Festus or anyone else would threaten to put him or release him to those that wanted to murder him, then when he played that card as a Roman citizen, that um, I, I, I pledge myself, I appeal unto Caesar. That means I'm going to go all the way to the top. Well, that, that nailed it. When he appealed to Caesar, it's every right of a Roman to have that right, especially, uh, and there was a great deal. Why, how are we going to explain their thinking that we've got him in chains. He's done nothing. Verse 32. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. But when he made that appeal, that locked it in, that he was, uh, in making that appeal, that he had to go to Rome. And of course, that was God's plan coming out the gate. God has a purpose for him in Rome, and to Rome he is going. So um, here we have um, that situation. Paul playing it um, uh, right, I mean, a perfect score. You know, you always want to remember when, when we appeal to the Lord Jesus Christ, when you were delivered up before the spurious Messiah, then never back away from that. Regardless of how tempting, if it should seem tempting at some time, then, and I doubt that it ever would be, then know that you're going to appeal to the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to appeal to Almighty God as far as your inheritance and your judgment for God is the judge of all. And when you are delivered up before the enemy, then naturally we're not to premeditate what we will say, but we can see the operation of the Holy Spirit in this. And it gives you a pretty good idea of, of how and what is utilized, what was utilized. Moses, the teaching of Moses and the prophets and as I stated, we can add the apostles to that, which is to, which is to say the New Testament, giving us a volume as he came in that volume where he would say in Hebrews chapter 10, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, then teach it as that, that volume unfolds. And it does as Paul forestated, it takes the darkness and shines light on it. It takes Satan and dispels him and brings forth the truth of Messiah. And it brings people to repentance for their sadness, their sins, and brings them into a work of God, a serving of God, a child of God. That's what those things do. And that's what Paul is being utilized here to show us that regardless of how things seem, when God's in control, we always have the victory because he always has the victory and we just happen to be family. Okay, off to Rome? You bet. Chapter 27, verse 1. 
And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, and this we, of course, is Luke. He's going right along. They delivered Paul and certain other prisoners unto one named Julius, that's soft-haired, a centurion of Augustus' band. Being a centurion of Augustus' band means he was probably handpicked from Caesar himself uh, as, as a personal uh, uh, part of his uh, guard. Verse 2. And entering into a ship of Adri Ad Adramitium, we launched, to say, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia. One Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. Uh, and uh, there we have it, the Aristarchus being the best ruler, okay, meaning being translated. Verse 3, And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius uh, courteously entreated Paul, was nice to him, and gave him liberty to go in unto his friends to refresh himself. Now that shows you the freedom that Paul as a prisoner certainly had. And uh, we ha this Julius, soft-haired, this one that is very close to Augustus, uh, had the authority to do this. Why he trusted Paul knew Paul to that point and and did trust him. In, in probably the next lecture, I will show you, we're going to be making a trip, a voyage, and I will show you all at one time the traveling and how things came to pass where you can visually f fix it on a map. Sidon, as you know, is, uh, is right off, uh, right next to Tyre. And, and right by the Mediterranean uh, Sea, whereby they will sell across. And, and I'll, I'll, let's, let's picture the land a little bit, if we may. If, if you go out across the Mediterranean, which soon it would touch Africa, there is shallow, sandy area that is almost death to go on to by a ship. So there, there are perils of danger in danger uh, on, on this voyage if, if weather should be uh, contentious. So we'll cover all that and then I'll show you that uh, uh, so you can picture it in your mind and have a better idea. But we'll cover it first by scripture. Verse 4. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Just we just we went under instead of over. Okay, verse five. And when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, of many people, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And uh, on we go. Six. And there the centurion found a ship of Alexander sailing into Italy, and he put us. Therein, in other words, he changed. This was no doubt a grain ship uh, for trade, taking grain, uh, wheat, or, wheat or rice, most likely wheat, or, or maybe corn, taking it to Italy for trade. This was a great trade route. And um, uh, with this ship going directly to Italy, it was ideal that uh, that Julius, no doubt, could could place them aboard it, and it would certainly uh, save um, a great deal of. Um, they change ships, in other words, and uh, their this Egyptian ship is a large ship. Verse seven, and when we had sailed slowly many days, in other words, there wasn't much wind, and scarce were come over against. Um, uh, and in thus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmoni. And um, that means clothed, and uh, there they were, verse 8. And hardly past it came into a place which is called the Fair Heavens. This Fair Heavens, mean, heavens means port, 
okay, a port called Fair there. Nigh whereunto was the city of Lysia, or Lysia, as some would say. And verse 9, Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. In other words, the Day of Atonement is past. We're probably about October the 1st. And there are hurricanes and typhoons in this area. Extremely dangerous. And God, you must remember, is directing Paul. And Paul knows and understands. <clears throat> Why? Because God speaks to him. God leads him. And uh, so it is. So Paul admonished them. Let's go with the next verse, verse 10. And he said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the laden of, and ship, not only your load and the ship itself, but also of our lives. That means even souls. It's going to be a dangerous situation. Verse 11, Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Why? Because he, wasn't, he was not a spiritual man. The master of the ship, Fair Havens was not a good place to winter. But we've got a place just a little further on over here where liberty is fantastic, okay? to winter there and, uh, and be safe from any storm that might come by. And it was just a few miles, just a little ways down the coast here. And boy, we've got a port that uh, finished where things pop, okay? Good sailor's town, all right? And we can make her there. Verse 12, and because the haven was not commodious to winter, in, wasn't, wasn't much going on there, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice uh, and there to winter, good liberty, okay, which is an haven of Crete and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. In other words, it's a good place to go, good place to be, good place to winter. Sometimes just a little distance too far when God has already given a warning is just one step too far. You want to remember that in your life. Always go according to God's word. Verse 13, And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they cut loose from the shore they sailed close by Crete. Uh, things looking good. That soft wind just sucked them right into it. Okay. I mean, uh, that soft wind just before the big, big storm. Okay. Verse 14. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachladon. And what this is, is uh, it's a hurricane, okay? There are, there are north by northeast. It could be translated in, by in some mind, but uh, basically what it is, is uh, uh, it's a hurricane, okay? I mean, a bad one. And they're at sea. That's not good. 15. And when the ship was caught, and could not bear up into the wind. We let her drive. That's all you could do. Pull the mainsail. Maybe put out a little bit of a jib so that it would, it would run with that wind to keep it uh, straight. 16. And running under a certain island, which is called Claudia, we had much work to come by the boat. Now, they're on a ship. 
But trailing along behind is a little old boat that they use to, you know, go ashore on if they if they anchor offshore. This is a bigger ship, and it's it's about to beat the back of the boat in. So with much work, they pulled it up on board. Okay and uh, brought the boat aboard the ship. This is the way you can tell a ship is something big enough that a boat can be put aboard it, like a lifeboat on ships, okay? Um, nautical terms, that terminology that will last even to this day. It's a skiff or a lifeboat, okay? Verse 17, which when they had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strike sail, and so were driven. In other words, those are those quicksands I was telling you that's down off the African coast. You hit those and, and you're doomed. Okay. But to girt the ship, what does that mean? Well, ships of this nature were put together with planking, with timbers, and they had cables or chains or lines whereby it was a girt, like you would put a belt on your body, and it went under and helped hold the ship together. But it's taken a beating. I mean, we're in a hurricane in, in an old time sailing vessel and have lost all control because of the wind and the seas other than to let her drive. And you might say, in a sense, God's driving the ship as he drives many ships. So here we go. And like I said, next, in the next lecture, I will probably get a chart out and we'll visualize this as, because we're going to end up ultimately in Italy. But we're going to have a few side trips here and how interesting it is. We've had some events that have even transpired in, in uh, our modern day current events in a couple of presidents hence back, I should say, that transpired in this same place. I'll discuss that as we come to it. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The book of